Hello and welcome to a very noisy edition of Facebook Live, our special Oddtober series of Facebook Lives here at the Tennessee Aquarium. We are in, uh, as I said, a very noisy and probably not oft visited location in the aquarium. This is our quarantine room. Uh, most people have probably never seen this. This is actually where we keep a lot of animals when they're not on exhibit, not Cheryl Crossley. Uh, we don't keep her down here. Cheryl, you are one of our senior aquarists, correct? Very cool. Now, uh, in the interest of you all actually being able to hear Cheryl, uh, we're going to let Cheryl take off her mask and I'm going to step very far away uh, and, and hopefully I'll just have to scream at the, the camera and hopefully you'll be able to hear us. But today, uh, we are focused on all things cephalopod uh, and maybe Cheryl, the best place to start is just to tell us what is a cephalopod. Now, people might look at a cuttlefish and think, well, that, just, that looks like a squid. So what are some of the things that distinguish them uh, physically from squid? Now, we have had cuttlefish uh, many times. Uh, I've been working here for about four years. We've had cuttlefish off and on different species uh, fairly frequently. Over the summer, uh, when we were closed, uh, we didn't have them for a little while. Once we reopened, and people really missed them. Uh, it was something we heard a lot of comments about, where are the cuttlefish? We love the cuttlefish. Why do you think, you know, this, is, uh, this whole series this month, this Oddtober celebration we're doing, is about the odd side of nature. Uh, do you think the fact that cuttlefish are a little bit strange, have a little bit weird adaptations and behaviors is part of the reason why people like them so much? I think so. They change color. They have a lot of really interesting behaviors. Um, they also, when we're feeding them, they shoot their tentacles out and grab the food, so that's kind of exciting. Um, I have a lot of people ask me about them inking. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of really, really neat um, features. They also are very responsive to us because they have really good eyesight. Squid, cuttlefish, octopus can see things really well because they're predators, so they have to be able to hunt down their prey. And a lot of times they'll react to visitors outside of the exhibit window, and they're looking at us just as much as we're looking at them. They have a very cool looking pupil too. And I don't know if those of you who are watching, I'm not sure how good the stream is, uh, the quality of the stream is, but if you look really closely at their eyes, their eye, the pupil is just super interestingly shaped. And there's a reason for that, right? Yeah, so it's a W-shaped pupil. And from what I've read, and I, I could be wrong on this, but from what I've read, they're typically in coastal shallow water where the sunlight can be really bright. And that W shape kind of acts like a little visor for them when the sun is really bright. Now, if they get excited or um, uh, if it's darker out, you'll look at that pupil and it'll almost look completely square or round because it's opened up quite a bit. That's really cool. Now, I don't want to neglect those of you who are being 
following instructions rather well and adding your comments and uh, shout outs to this. So let me look real quick. We've got some comments coming in. Uh, Aaron Colesmith would like to know which way is forward on a cuttlefish? Very cool. All right, so we've talked about uh, their their eyesight. Uh, we've talked a little bit about their, not to anthropomorphize, but their their intelligence, uh, likening them to you know being social animals. What are some other interesting adaptations that cuttlefish have that maybe set them apart? That is cool. And uh, speaking of reproduction, when you come to the aquarium and you see their uh, exhibit, when they have laid eggs, those eggs look really cool. And the way they lay them is also really interesting. them doing uh, surrounding the eggs with the ink? I think it just helps hide the egg and hide the embryo inside for just a little bit longer. These guys are going to lay their eggs and then the adults will pass away so they're not going to be there taking care of the eggs or guarding them like we see in some other cephalopods like octopus. Now speaking of octopus which hopefully we'll get a chance to go and visit later. We're doing this a little bit flying by the seat of our pants today because uh, things situations have changed. Uh, but speaking of changing and octopus, uh, one other thing that they share in common with octopus, and you're probably seeing it a little bit now, is their ability to change their appearance. So can you talk a little bit about the how and why that of their, their camouflage, their color alteration? Sure. Um, both species have um, what we call chromatophores, which are color changing cells in their skin. Um, and they can also change the texture of their skin a little bit. These guys tend to stay pretty smooth. Oh, there's a good eye spot on that guy. Um, but they can change um, their color in a split second. Um, and it, they use it for camouflage, but they also will use it to communicate with each other. And it's, I kind of think of it as like a mood ring. If one cuttlefish wants another cuttlefish to go away, he's And one other really kind of uh, fascinating element of that is you, they, communication, but also mating. And so some of them, they actually engage in a bit of like, so how, speaking of Halloween, this is kind of like trick or treat. They can trick each other. Which is typically uh, more mottled or pale because the 
That's pretty clever. Have they done any studies? Uh, and this is, I'm asking you, because uh, they're you a curveball. Have there been any studies about their, their relative intelligence? Do we know how smart they are? Um, with octopus, absolutely. With cuttlefish, um, they don't have the same, uh, at least in my experience, they don't have the same uh, playful intelligence that octopus do. But they definitely learn, like, the color of our shirts. They learn who's going to come and feed them and our routines. Um, so there is some intelligence there, but they don't learn to open toys and, and solve puzzles like the octopus does. Uh, and you you did a great uh, impersonation of a cuttlefish earlier. If you missed it, Dag, there it is again. Uh, one thing that I think is super cool about cuttlefish is how they'll raise two of those arms. And I'm doing it, you can't see it. Uh, but they'll raise it, like, uh, almost, and I'm not sure if it, what that gesture means, whether it's threatening or what, what that is. Yeah, I'm not 100% what I typically, when I see it, I associate it with, one, they're trying to camouflage, so when they do it, they kind of like look like um, an algae um, or a plant and so they're trying to camouflage but also by raising those two arms they're exposing their mouth so if something does come after them their mouth is right there and that's how they're going to defend themselves now we we mentioned that they shoot those their uh their arm well not arms so this is right. where we, we do the definition <laughs> uh arms and tentacles are two different things correct so everybody knows octopus have eight arms. Cuttlefish actually have 10 appendages and squid do as well. So these guys have eight arms and they have two tentacles. So that's a total of 10. The arms have suction cups that go all the way from the tip of the arm all the way up toward the body. The tentacles just have two, um, two pads of suction cups at the very end. Very cool. What kinds of things do they eat? Um, so these guys in the water feeding on um, fish, shrimp, um, any kind of little crab that they can catch. And we try to emulate that as much as possible here at the aquarium. So you might see uh, right now there's a couple of pieces of smelt that are on the bottom that they get picked up. Um, but we also give them um, shrimp and uh, sometimes clam. Clam isn't really their favorite though, so sometimes I have to trick them into eating that. When we have live feed, they'll get grass shrimp or small killifish. All right. Uh, Chanda Wilson, I've uh, been neglecting these questions, would like to know, how can you tell the difference between males and females? We talked about them pretending to be the other, the other sex, but how do you tell? So with cuttlefish, it's really difficult. So cuttlefish are one kind of cephalopod. Uh, Cheryl's done an excellent job of giving us a crash course in cuttlefish, uh, but we do have other cephalopods here at the aquarium, uh, one of which we've talked about a couple times in the course of this discussion. That's the giant Pacific octopus. Uh, and we're gonna figure out now, together, all of us, as a, group, as a group, as a community, we're gonna find out whether we need to continue this Facebook Live down here in the quarantine room or whether we need to take this show on the road and do a two-parter over in Boneless Beauties. Uh, so we're gonna go look real quick and see if we can catch one of our senior aquarists who specializes in caring for the octopus and maybe do that uh, part of this discussion down here. And if not, we'll end things for now and then jump back on in a few minutes once I've had a chance to cross over to the other building. But in the meantime, Cheryl, thank you so much for giving us, uh, uh, like I said, a crash course in cuttlefish for cephalopalooza. <laughs> Yay. Yay, all right, let's go try and find Danny Alexander, who is uh, one of our other senior aquarists, he cares for our giant Pacific octopuses, and I think he said he was going to try and come down. There he is. Danny Alexander, you're on live with lots of people. Oh, it's quieter over here. This is wonderful. Now, Danny, you are no stranger to our Facebook lives. We have done several of them with you, but, you know, people love octopuses. 
And it is, it's Cephalopalooza. I don't know if you knew that. I decided that earlier today. Cephalopalooza? Cephalopalooza. I like it. Yeah. Point the word, Casey. You're good at that. That's what I'm, that's why they pay me those big bucks. Uh, so we are here, uh, the other side of the key room, to uh, talk about our giant Pacific octopus. And you brought down, I think, some food. I did. And uh, Spooky is over here. She's over here on the wall. She's spooky. resting. Spooky. That's Spooky. Yeah. Tabasco is the one that's over in the other building on exhibit right now. He's the rowdy, feisty one. Spooky is in retirement now. So she really isn't social anymore and she just likes to rest a lot. So this is Spooky. We, we just moved her over here to this quarantine room uh, last Monday. We moved her over here. Tabasco was over here also while we renovated their exhibit. Um, but we're not gonna put Spooky back on exhibit because she is at the end of her life. So we're gonna let her retire peacefully here in the quarantine room. Tabasco, we just put him on exhibit like two hours ago. So he's back over in the other building right now. And I actually was late, uh, as you all know, I was late, so we were late doing the Facebook Live because I was over in the other building thinking we were gonna be over there with Tabasco and the cuttlefish over there. So I apologize, all you guys, for being a little bit late. Well, that's okay, because you know what? This gives us an opportunity to talk about a couple of things that are pretty important when it comes to uh, cephalopods, and that's lifespan. And also, uh, if you want to add to your marine biology vocabulary, although I guess it's not just marine biology that this applies to, uh, but a good word to learn from this is senescence. Oh, yes. So what is senescence? Senescence is basically the end of life. So with octopuses, they reach a period of senescence, and it's usually for giant Pacific octopuses, it's about... Uh, between three and five years. So even as young as three years old, the octopuses basically are at the end of their life. Now, some of the signs that they're getting close to being two and a half or three years old is they start slowing down on eating. Uh, females, they start looking for a place to build a den. The ones that are on exhibit, that we've had on exhibit, they start moving rocks around and, and uh, they're roaming the exhibit a lot and they slow down on their eating. And that's usually a sign that they're approaching senescence. Now females, at about two and a half years, they're starting to produce eggs. And if they were in the wild, they would be hoping to find a male so that uh, they could get those eggs fertilized. Now, if on an exhibit like what we have here, we don't try to let a male and a female get together because there's some literature out there that says in the court, even though giant Pacific octopuses are solitary, really the only time they get together is for mating. And after mating, one could actually kill the other. It's a strange science. Uh, that, that's a strange biology for giant Pacific octopus, but that's always a possibility. And besides that, there's plenty of giant Pacific octopuses in the ocean, and we don't need to try to breed them because they have thousands of eggs. Females generate thousands of eggs, and uh, we would know what we would do with thousands of microscopic octopuses. So it's just not good sense for us to try to breed giant Pacific octopus. But the females produce eggs nonetheless. Spooky had eggs over in the exhibit in the other building. Uh, for the past three or four months, her eggs have been over there. She had knocked most of them down into the gravel. So there wasn't too many left over there when we took them off exhibit earlier this week. But the eggs are the size of a grain of rice, and I should have got a sample of them so I could have showed you guys, but I wasn't thinking ahead. We cleaned all those eggs out and actually just threw them away. They weren't viable, so don't worry that we threw a bunch of baby octopuses away because there were no baby octopuses in those eggs that were the size of a grain of rice. They weren't fertilized. They were not fertilized, no. All right. Well, we've got we do have a question from uh, Marie Tuggy who would like to know 
So is this going to be the last place, her final holding area, or will she get a nice larger tank to live out her days in? Well, she doesn't need a larger tank because she basically finds one spot and she doesn't really move from that one spot. Even if we had her a huge mansion of a tank, she would not move from one spot. She would just stay in one spot until the end of her life. So she will retire peacefully where she's at in this, uh, this holding tank that she's in right now. All right, well, you mentioned uh, that one of the signs of senescence is that they slow down and are not eating as much. Yes. Um, but what do, what do giant, octo giant Pacific octopuses eat? Ah, well, let me run to the refrigerator right quick, and I will show you what giant Pacific octopuses eat. Well, I'll show you some of the stuff we feed them, but they do eat basically a few of the same things in the wild as what I'm getting ready to show you. I'm going to take 30 seconds and run and get that food real quick to show you guys, because I want you all to try to guess what one of the items is in. Yeah. Most of them you can tell what it is, but there's one thing, it's always fun to let you guys try to figure out what that is. So Ooh, I know what this is. Let me run and get it real quick, you guys. All right, now while Danny is going to get uh, the Giant Pacific Octopus's diet, so you can get an idea of the kinds of things that uh, our Giant Pacific Octopuses eat, uh, make sure that you're sending your, your questions to us in the comments down below. We are, I'll, I'm happy to pass them on to Danny. Danny has worked with octopuses for a long, long time. He knows a lot about their biology, about their behaviors, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any question that you have. And we have had a couple of really good ones coming in, so thank you so much for sharing those and for letting us know where you're watching from. It's always nice to engage with our fans wherever they are, whether it's here in Chattanooga or all over the world. And Danny, true to his word actually is in fact faster than 30 seconds and so I don't even have to try and fill time. Yes, I was lightning fast for you guys. I didn't want to keep you waiting. Okay, so here we have a bowl full of a number of things that we feed the giant Pacific octopuses. Now in the wild, they're going to, their favorite is shrimp, things like shrimp and crabs and some fish also. But we're throwing a little something extra in there. They may find some of this in the wild too. And we'll see if you guys can figure out what it is. Now I'm going to pick each of these items up one by one. But I'm going to save the mystery item for last. So you guys take a look at this. And you can start responding and tell me what this is. I know you all know what that is. Alright, what, what do you think that is guys? That should be easy, that one right there. So that's one of their favorite things, is this item right here. I feel like we need like the Jeopardy theme song to start playing. <laughs> do, 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 yeah. do. So this would be considered a crustacean, and I know you guys know what crustaceans are. They usually have a shell, they can usually crawl along the bottom. Most of y'all are going to like eating this, I do. All right, no, they're all, they have shy fingers today. No one is typing down any guesses in the comments. So, Danny, what is that? Okay, what you guys are looking at is a shrimp right here. I know y'all knew what that <laughs> Robin was. Robin Hurt said shrimp and grits right at the last second. Shrimp and grits, all right. Okay, now let me hold up another little cutie. Oh, you guys love that. Speaking right. of cephalopods. <laughs> yes, another cephalopod. What could that be? Maybe that will be on your menu tonight. All right, we had a couple of latecomers saying shrimp, so kudos to you all for knowing your seafood. Right. Now, what is this? What is Danny holding this time? And I think Casey's gonna eat this uh, when we're done here. I think Casey wants to eat this. Yeah, I mean, I skipped lunch, so uh, <laughs> happy, to, happy to get that in late. All right, no one's answering. It might be a delay in the in the live stream for all I know. Oh, yeah. Ah, Jordan Dill says squid. All right, that's it. Very good. <laughs> Gar Garden Hippie says cuttlefish. Well, well, we did talk earlier. Cheryl did mention we talked about how they are. They look very similar. So yeah, they are related. Yes, squid and cuttlefish are related. Now I got a couple of fish items here. So you guys don't need to try to guess what these are because there's so many millions of fish out there. But this one is called a smelt and this one is called a capelin. 
That bigger capelin is actually the main diet for the penguins. But we steal a little bit of it for the, uh, for the fish and the octopuses because uh, they really like capelin too. But the penguins, that's the main diet, is capelin is their main diet. Let me see. Oh, well, now I'm down to the mystery item. Oh, gosh. There if you all go. get this and you haven't answered this before, I'll be very impressed. Oh, yeah. You guys come up with this. You need to win a prize of some kind because that's usually a very tough item right there. Maybe we can give them this. Maybe they can have that for lunch if oh, they get it right. Yes. And actually, they do serve one type of this, one species of this. You can actually get it. You can get it. In, well, if I give you that hint, you'll know what it is. Allison Carter has guessed. She says clam. Oh, she got it. Oh, good job, Allison. It is clam. So I guess, Allison, if you want to come and have a bowl full of clam, come on down and we'll fix you up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's some of the things that we feed the octopuses. And believe it or not, you guys, Spooky actually moved. She was over there. Now she's over here close to Casey and I. Oh, wow. I can't believe she's moving around. That's amazing. Now, this would be a good opportunity for us to talk about the fact that, uh, weirdly, uh, octopuses and parrots have something in common. Octopuses and cape. And parrots. Well, birds, really. Birds and octopuses have oh, something in common. okay. You said parrots. Parrots, yeah. I thought you said carrots, like the mentioned. <laughs> no, not carrots. Well, we are downstairs in a very low, noisy, pump-filled room <laughs> and talking through masks. But no, Bir yes. birds and octopuses have a weird similarity. Do you guys know what an octopus has that a bird has? You guys throw that out there right quick. I will give you a little bit before I say what it is. But birds and octopuses, and here's Spooky right here. Yeah, see, she kind of goes away. She's not social anymore. So you say that as if in under normal circumstances earlier in her life, she would have been social. They're not social in the wild, but once you've had them in captivity for uh, some period of time, they become social. They actually get to where they can recognize their keeper, whoever feeds them every day. A lot of times they'll show recognition. If you have two people come to their tank and one person is someone who spent a lot of time with them and another one who hasn't, a lot of times they will go to the person that they have spent the most time with, just like a dog might do. So some say that octopuses are like a cross between a dog and a cat. They're very intelligent, and when they're in captivity, they do become more social. But once they go into their senescent, the senescent part of their life, they are kind of antisocial, so to speak, and they really don't want any social activity whatsoever. They just want to be left alone. And, that's, and when I touched Spooky just a little while ago, she actually pulled away from me and went deeper into the tank. So she really don't want to be bothered. Now, we have had a few guesses come in, and I think these people are spot on that uh, octopuses and birds both have beaks. They do. Yep, octopuses have a beak like a bird. It looks just like a bird's beak. Those beaks are very strong. They can crack open shells. Uh, you know, they can crack through a, a shrimp shell, a crab shell, mussel shell. And uh, they have a special type of, of tongue that's called a radula. And that radula actually has a little bit of venom uh, with it. And they, once they break through a shell with that radula, they can actually put a little venomous compound into whatever prey that they're trying to eat, if it's something with a shell, and, and it helps actually break it down. So octopuses, in a way, are kind of creepy. They're beautiful and creepy in the same respect. Um, they would be a terrifying monster, and there's been some movies with giant squid, giant octopuses, 
And that could be absolutely terrifying if there were giant squid and octopus. Well, there are giant squid out there. This is the largest octopus in the world, but on average, they only get to be between 40 and 60 pounds, even though there's some record out there of a 600 pound octopus. Wow. With a 30 foot reach between two arms. 30 feet, you guys. That's probably like about three car lengths. That octopus could sit on one car and reach to the ends of two other cars end to end, believe it or not. That's incredible. That is crazy to think that way. Now, as people are watching this, Danny, some people might be wondering what exactly is going on on the side of its mantle. Okay, so octopuses, like fish, they have gills. But right now, right by that one gill on this side, she's also got her siphon over here, that little round one. That's called a siphon. And cuttlefish have that also, but cuttlefish, is, theirs is very small and hard to see. But you can see spooky siphon, and she takes water in those larger openings that are called her gills. She takes water in over her gills. That's how she gets oxygen out of the water. And then she releases that water back out of that siphon. And when they're healthy octopuses swimming around in the ocean, they can actually jet backwards very quickly uh, by forcing water very swiftly out of that siphon. So they can take water in through their gills and then jet it out of that siphon for movement, very quick movement in the ocean if she's chasing something or trying to get away from a predator. So we've talked about the kinds of things that octopuses eat but it sounds like they're not necessarily at the top of the food chain. So what things would eat an octopus? Well, some larger sharks might be interested in an octopus. And I think some species of seals uh, would also eat octopuses. Maybe some otters would. Uh, I don't know, a giant Pacific octopus, they would be a bit of a challenge for some animals though, because of their size. In the open ocean, they can get pretty good size like I said, 40 to 60 pounds or so, and have an arm spread of maybe 10, 10 to 15 feet. Uh, so giant Pacific octopuses are definitely a force to be reckoned with. Now, there was one aquarium, I can't remember which one, that kept having some of their smaller sharks disappear. Well, they set up a 24-7 camera, and they caught the culprit, and it was their giant Pacific octopuses taking out some of their smaller sharks. So an octopus can actually, if the shark's a small one, they can take out a shark. Now Carrie, uh, Carrie Irvin says she's beautiful. All right, Carrie. Uh, spooky, I think she can sense that you feel that way. She looks very peaceful right now. <clears throat> and if you saw Tabasco, you would see a little different in coloration between Tabasco our young, feisty, fiery octopus. He's a real beautiful deep red. And Spooky used to be that real beautiful deep, deep red. But now she's a little bit faded out. It's almost like, uh, like our grandmothers and grandfathers getting older and getting gray. So Spooky is kind of like that in a sense. Wow. Well, I think that uh, this is probably a good place for us to wrap up. Uh, this cephal cephalopalooza uh, edition of our, of our Oddtober series of Facebook Lives. We will be coming back to you guys every week for the rest of the month uh, with, I think, three Facebook Lives a week. So keep an eye on our Facebook page. We'll be making sure that we announce those in advance. Uh, they will usually be, I think, without... With, I don't think there are any exceptions, that they're always going to be at about 3.30 p.m. So kind of plan your afternoons around that if you're home with the kids. This is a pretty good way to have some uh, science at home learning if you're if you're doing homeschooling as a lot of people are still doing uh, these days even though some schools have opened back up uh, we are happy to answer those questions bring a little science education to your lives help you guys connect with the beautiful wildlife here at the Tennessee Aquarium whether they're odd or not so uh, Danny thank you again for taking the time to lend us your expertise and uh, thank you to well thank you guys for stopping by too and uh, all of y'all should try saying 
Supala Palooza three times without messing up. I think I said it three times and messed up every time. So if you can do it, then you're doing better than I am. Uh, but uh, so we'll say goodbye to Smokey as well. And uh, just end the live stream here. But uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for those questions and shout outs. And we will see you again next week for the next round of Oddtober themed Facebook Lives here at the Tennessee Aquarium. See you around soon. Thanks so much for watching.